Okay, so you're reading through your Bible, and you are in Malachi, and you finish it, the last book of the Old Testament. Then you turn one page and begin Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, and everything is different. What happened in two pages? Seriously, if you've ever read straight through the Bible, you've probably had questions about why things are so different between the last page of the Old Testament and the first page of the New Testament. At the end of the Old Testament, the Jewish people are returning to Israel under the rule of the Persian Empire and building everything up from the ground after war and exile destroyed them. But when the New Testament opens, the Jewish people are living under the rule of the Roman Empire and enjoying the metropolis of Jerusalem and the amenities that it offers. People like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herods do not exist in the Old Testament, but are firmly established in power when the New Testament opens. Why does everything seem so different when you just flip a page? And why doesn't the Bible mention these things at all? The truth is that though there's just one page between the New and the Old Testaments, there was a large span of time between them, approximately 400 years. That's right, the Bible skips 400 years into the future in one turn of a page. What can happen in 400 years? Well, it turns out a lot. 400 years from the day this video was released, the pilgrims were in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and would not see land for another two weeks. 400 years is a long, long time. The gap between the Testaments is often called the intertestamental period by scholars, but is also referred to as the silent years because God sends no prophets between Malachi and John the Baptizer. Complete radio silence from God. Nothing for generations until John the Baptizer's message burst onto the scene. Repent of your sins. Turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, there are a few questions that immediately come to mind for me. One is, why aren't these 400 silent years mentioned in Scripture? Two, what happened to change so much between Malachi and Matthew? And three, why did Jesus choose to come when he did? Why not come 200 years or 1,000 years later? Why, why didn't Jesus just come this year in 2020? As for the last question, I want to give that its own video. So make sure you're subscribed here on YouTube so that you can catch it when it debuts on December 10th. It's going to be a very, very interesting video. Let's tackle the first question first. Why aren't these 400 silent years mentioned in Scripture? Well, actually they are, but you have to know where to look. God actually tells Daniel what will happen in incredible details more than 100 years before the intertestamental period begins and 500 years before it ends. If you're asking what specific places in Daniel, it's chapters 2, 7, 8, and 11. Now, obviously, I can't read four entire chapters in this concise video. Obviously. But I'll give you verse numbers so that you can check them out for yourself as we go. The prophecies contained in the four chapters of Daniel all concern the five world empires that would have a direct effect on the nation of Israel. Four of them are now in the past, and one of them is still yet to come. And now that Israel is a nation since 1948, that's hashtag fulfilled prophecy. What we see in Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11 is that God reveals more and more detail to Daniel as Daniel gets older. It's just a few pages to us, but they were unfolding over an entire lifetime for Daniel. The big fancy word for this is progressive revelation. God reveals more and more to us about who he is and what he's doing as the Bible unfolds. Now, we do the same thing in our lives. For instance, we progressively reveal mathematical concepts to children. We don't start them with calculus. We start them with more basic things like addition and subtraction and work up to more advanced ideas. Likewise, in Daniel 2, God simply lays out the five major kingdoms, but in Daniel 11, God gives Daniel specific events and details about the coming future. That's progressive revelation. In Daniel 2, the five empires of the earth that have a direct effect on Israel are Babylon, then Persia, then Greece, then Rome, then a future empire to arise one day in our future. For you visual learners out there, let me put a timeline on the screen. Boop. There's the timeline between the Testaments, roughly 400 BC to 25 AD. By 400 BC, the first empire, Babylon, has already fallen to the second empire, Persia. 
so we won't see it on our timeline. And the empire still to come hasn't come yet, so it will also not be on our timeline. Obviously. That leaves us with a middle three, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, if you're not a history buff, don't stop watching. My goal is to make the most interesting history video you've ever seen. If the word history is boring to you, just chop off the H and the I and just focus on the story part. That's what history is, a real story. Just because someone made real stories boring in the past, that doesn't mean that other people can't make them interesting for you. As a matter of fact, let's make this the question of the video. Growing up, did you like history class or was it boring to you? And if you do like history, what's your favorite period of history to study? Remember, commenting and hitting like really, really, really help here on YouTube. So help a brother out. Hit like and leave me a comment below. Okay, let's throw our three empires on the timeline. All three civilizations already exist at the point of the Old Testament closing, but Greece and Rome are yet to be unified into an empire. Fun fact, speaking of Greece, before the Old Testament ends, before Nehemiah rebuilds the wall, and before Esther becomes queen of Persia, the Battle of Thermopylae takes place. Now, if you're not a history buff, that means that the movie 300 already has happened. This is Sparta! Now, part of getting into a story is putting yourself in the shoes of those living it. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of a Jewish person living in Jerusalem as Malachi's ministry ends and the Old Testament is closed. Now imagine this, you're living in the city of your ancestors after a generation was exiled by the Babylonian Empire. Commerce is returning as Nehemiah's defensive wall is rebuilt, and the worship of God in the temple has returned. Life is getting back to normal, not just after one year of hardship like 2020, but after 70 years of desolation. Life is good again for you and your people. You have economic and religious freedom under Persian rule. In 343, the Persians conquer Egypt, adding the Nile Delta and Libya to the empire. You don't care, because for you, life is good under their rule. Four years later, you begin to hear that a new empire is forming, as Philip of Macedon conquers all of Greece. Oh, I, I don't like that word. <clears throat> Unites all of Greece. Okay, that's better, that's better. Just three years after that, Philip is assassinated, and revolts break out all over his empire. His son, Alexander the Great, mentored by Aristotle himself, becomes king and crushes those rebellions. Alexander wastes no time and begins conquering new lands and warring with the Persians. They are no match for Alexander and his swift army. Asia Minor falls, Judah and your city of Jerusalem falls, Egypt falls, and finally the last remnants of the Persian Empire collapse. But Alexander isn't done. He takes part of India before his war-weary army mutinies and demands that they return home after a decade of constant conquest. Alexander's rule over Jerusalem wasn't the end of the world, but he did demand that his culture, Greek culture, be the new way of doing things. Sure, you could still practice the Jewish religion, but you had to do it in a Greek way, speak the Greek language, and integrate Greek ideas into public life. At the young age of 33, Alexander suddenly dies in 323. With no heirs, his empire is carved up by his four top generals. And as you can imagine, things do not go well. Though the fractured Greek empire technically lasts until about 31 BC, that's a run of about 308 years. These four guys and their descendants, especially the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, fight and fight and fight with each other. Judah initially is under the control of the Ptolemies, and though things were pretty good under them, the Old Testament is even translated into Greek during this time. More on that in next week's video, going to be a great one. This constant warring between the Seleucids of the north and the Ptolemaics of the south leave Judah devastated as it's caught in the middle of the struggle. One ruler of the north, Antiochus Epiphanes, is especially bad. After failing a second attack on Egypt and being fended off by the meddling Roman navy, he returns to Jerusalem and causes immense suffering. In 167, he desecrates the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. He outlaws the Torah, and all Jewish practices are forbidden. Following the Jewish law, circumcision, and even observing a Sabbath day of rest are punished with swift execution. Like has happened so often in history, this tyranny and these atrocities were met with resistance. In 166, the Maccabean Revolt began. Judas the Hammer Maccabeus, seriously, his name was that cool, took a small guerrilla revolt from a sporadic resistance to a full-fledged revolution that granted them a peace deal in 165 and restored religious liberty and quasi-independence to Judah. 
The holiday Hanukkah celebrates this victory. Don't tread on the hammer. Eventually, the Seleucids gained some control back over Jerusalem, but left it largely to govern itself. During this time, two camps emerged in Judah, the Hasidics and the Hellenizers. Hasidics wanted to retain historic Judaism. They were the forerunners of the Pharisees. Yes, the Pharisees that we know from the New Testament. Hellenizers, on the other hand, they wanted Judaism to progress and work to merge it with Greek thought and life. They were the forerunners of the Sadducees. Yes, the Sadducees you know from the New Testament. Weakened by fracturing and constant war, the Greek Empire fell piece by piece to the new kid on the block, Rome. In 63, Jerusalem fell to the Romans under the ruthless leadership of Pompey. As the Romans took Egypt, a descendant of Esau, you remember Jacob and Esau from Genesis, right? That descendant aligned himself with Julius Caesar and earned enough favor with Rome to make his son, Herod the Great, yes, the Herod you remember from the Christmas story, to eventually be made ruler over Judea in 37. After the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44, Octavius, the mighty Octavius has returned, consolidated power throughout the Roman Empire to become the first official Roman emperor. In 27, Octavian changed his name and his title to Caesar Augustus. Yes, the Caesar Augustus we see in the Christmas story. That leaves us with one piece of history left, Jesus. Jesus was born sometime around 6 BC. How do we know that? Because Jesus was born before Herod the Great died in 4 BC. That's what happened between the New and the Old Testament. Before we get out of here, let me ask one question. What does all of this mean for us? Sure, we had a lot of great information in this video, but what should be our takeaway? I think it should be this. Even when we don't see God working in the limelight, we can trust that God is working in the background. God wasn't AWOL during this time. God was actively setting things up for the arrival of the Messiah and even provided details to Daniel well before they unfolded. Galatians 4.4 says that when the right time came, God sent his son. God used this time to make circumstances ideal for Christ. Hey, I hope you learned something in this video. If you did, please consider sharing it and be sure to subscribe so that you can catch the next one when it drops on Tuesday. Before we go, a word about LifeWord. This incredible organization is reaching people through media, from radio towers and remote locations to digital media like this very video that you're watching. LifeWord is taking the good news of Jesus to people across the globe. To learn more and to join their mission, visit lifeword.org. See you next time. Grace and peace.